The hour is coming in which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. John 28 to 29, chapter 5. A glorious multitude which none can number, openly acquitted, pronounced blessed, and welcomed into the kingdom, prepared for them from the foundation of the world. Matthew 25, 34. Now they enter upon a state that deserves the name of life. They are all vital, all active, all glorious, all happy. They shine brighter than the stars in the firmament, like the sun forever and ever. All their faculties overflow with happiness. They mingle with the glorious company of angels. They behold that Saviour whom unseen they loved. They dwell in eternal intimacy with the Father of their spirits. They are employed with ever new and growing delight in the exalted services of the heavenly sanctuary. They shall never more fear nor feel the least touch of sorrow, pain, or any kind of misery but shall be as happy as their natures can admit through an immortal duration. What a glorious new creation is here! What illustrious, meaning shining, creatures formed of the dust! Shall any of us join in this happy company? Oh, shall any of us feeble, dying, sinful creatures share in their glory and happiness? This is a most interesting inquiry. The prospect would be delightful if our charity could hope that this will be the happy end of all the sons of men. But, alas, multitudes shall come forth, not to the resurrection of life, but to the resurrection of damnation. What terror is the sound! If audacious, that is, defined sinners in our world, make light of it. If their infernal, that is, belonging to hell, brethren, that feel its tremendous import, are not so hardy, but tremble, groan, and can trifle, that is, not take it serious, with it no more. Let us realize the miserable doom of this class of mankind. See them bursting into life from their subterranean that is beneath the earth dungeons. Horror throbs through every vein and glares wild and furious in their eyes. Every joint trembles and every countenance looks downcast and gloomy. Now they see that tremendous day of which they were warned in vain, and shudder at those terrors of which they once made light. They immediately know the grand business of the day, and the dreadful purpose for which they were roused from their slumbers in the grave, to be tried, to be convicted, to be condemned, and to be dragged away to execution. Conscience has been anticipating the trial in a separate state, and no sooner is the soul united to the body than immediately conscience ascends its throne in the breast. It begins to accuse, to convict, to pass sentence, to upbraid, that is, find fault with, and to torment. The sinner is condemned, condemned at his own tribunal before he arrives at the bar of his judge. The first act of consciousness in his new state of existence is a conviction that he is condemned and irrevocably, that is impossible to reverse or change, condemned creature. He enters the court knowing beforehand how it will go with him. When he finds himself ordered to the left hand of his judge, when he hears the dreadful sentence thundered out against him, 
Depart from me, ye cursed, Matthew 25.41, it was but what he expected. At the present time, he can flatter himself with vain hopes, and shut his eyes against the light of conviction, but then he will not be able to hope better. Then he must know the worst of his case. The formality of the judicial trial is necessary for the conviction of the world, but not for his. His own conscience has already determined his condition. However, to convince others of the justice of his doom, he is dragged and guarded from his grave to the judgment seat. With what horror does he view the burning throne and the frowning face of his judge? That Jesus whom he once disregarded, how he wishes for a covering of rocks and mountains to conceal him from his angry eye, but all in vain. Appear he must, he is ordered to the left among the trembling criminals. Now the trial comes on, all his evil deeds and all his omissions of duty are now produced against him. All the mercies he abused, all the chastisements he despised, all the means of grace he neglected or misimproved, that is, failed to use to a good purpose. Every sinful and every idle word, nay, his most secret thoughts and dispositions, are all exposed and brought into judgment against him. When the judge puts it to him, is it not so, sinner? Are not these charges true? Conscience obliges him to confess and cry out, Guilty, guilty. Now the trembling criminal, being plainly convicted and left without all plea and all excuse, the supreme judge in stern majesty and inexorable, that is not moved by any attempt to persuade justice, thunders out the dreadful sentence, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Matthew 25, 41 O oh, tremendous doom! Every word is big with terror, and shoots a thunderbolt through the heart. Depart away from my presence, I cannot bear so loathsome a sight. I once called thee to come to me, that thou mightest have life, but thou wouldest not regard the call. Now thou shalt never hear that inviting voice more. Depart from me, from me, the only fountain of happiness, the only proper good for an immortal mind. But, Lord, we may suppose the criminal to say, if I must depart, Bless me before I go. No, says the angry judge, depart accursed. Depart with my eternal and heavy curse upon thee, the curse of that power that made thee, a curse dreadfully efficacious, that is, successful in producing the intended result, which blasts whatever it falls upon, like flashes of consuming irresistible lightning. But if I must go away under thy curse, the criminal may be supposed to say, Let that be all my punishment. Let me depart to some agreeable or at least tolerable recess, that is remote, where I may meet with something to mitigate, that is to make less severe, the curse. No, depart into the fire. There burn in all the excruciating tortures of that outrageous element. But, Lord, if I must make my bed in fire, oh, let it be a transient, that is not lasting very long, blaze, that will soon burn itself out and put an end to my torment. No, depart into everlasting fire. There burn without consuming and be tormented without end. But, Lord, grant me, cries the poor wretch, 
at least the mitigation, that is the lessening of the pain, of friendly, entertaining and sympathizing company. Or, if this cannot be granted, grant me this small, this almost no request, to be doomed to some solitary corner in hell, where I shall be punished only by my own conscience and dine immediate hand. But, oh, deliver me from these malicious, tormenting devils. Banish me into some apartment in the infernal pit, far from their society. No, depart into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Thou must be one of their wretched crew forever. Thou didst join with them in sinning, and now must share in their punishment. Sentence being pronounced, it is immediately executed. These shall go away into everlasting punishment, Matthew 25.46, to the pit. There they are confined in chains of darkness, and in a lake burning with fire and brimstone forever, forever. In that dreadful word lies the emphasis of torment. It is a hell in hell. If they might be but released from pain, though it were by annihilation, after they have wept away ten thousand millions of ages in extremity of pain, it would be some mitigation, that is, a lessening of the intensity of the pain, some encouragement. But, alas, when as many millions of ages are past as the stars of heaven, or the sands on the seashore, or the atoms of dust in this huge globe of earth, their punishment is as far from an end as when the sentence was pronounced upon them for ever. There is no exhausting of that word when it is affixed to the highest degree of misery, the terror of the sound is utterly insupportable. See, sirs, what depends upon time, that span of time we may enjoy in this fleeting life, eternity, awful, all-important eternity depends upon it. All this while, conscience tears the sinner's heart with the most tormenting reflections. Oh, what a fair opportunity I once had for salvation, had I improved it. I was warned of the consequences of a life of sin and carelessness. I was told of the necessity of fate, repentance, and universal holiness of heart and life. I enjoyed a sufficient space for repentance, and all the necessary means of salvation. But fool that I was, I neglected all, I abused all. I refused to part with my sins. I refuse to engage seriously in religion and to seek God in earnest. And now I am lost forever without hope. Oh, for one of those months, one of those weeks, or even so much as one of those days or hours I once trifled away. With what earnestness, with what solicitude, that is carefulness, would I improve it? But all my opportunities are past, beyond recovery, and not a moment shall be given me for this purpose any more. Oh, what a fool I was to sell my soul for such trifles, to set so light by heaven and fall into hell through mere neglect and carelessness. Ye impenitent, that is, not repentant, unthinking sinners, Though you may now be able to silence or drown the clamors of your consciences, yet the time, or rather the dread eternity is coming, when they will speak in spite of you, when they will speak home and be felt by the most hardened and remorseless heart. Therefore, regard their warnings now while they may be the means of your recovery. You and I, are concerned in the solemn transaction of the day I have been describing. 
you and I shall either be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, or while mouldering in the grave. We shall hear the voice of the Son of God and come forth, either to the resurrection of life or to the resurrection of damnation. John 5, 28 to 29. And which, my brethren, shall be our doom? Can we foreknow it at this distance of time? I proposed it to your inquiry already. Whether you have any good reason to hope, you shall be of that happy number who shall rise to life. Now I propose it again with this counterpart. Have you any evidence to hope you shall not be of that wretched, numerous multitude who shall rise to damnation? If there be any inquiry within the compass of human knowledge that demands your solicitous, that is, careful thoughts, certainly it is this.